Swords inspire endless legends. They ignite our imagination, both through their form, function and social significance, and the morbid appeal inherently associated with instruments of death, a status symbol for many different warriors throughout the world. From Anglo-Saxon metalwork to Viking steel to Roman enforced control all the way to the Far East, swords are omnipresent. Regardless of its form or specific characteristic, a sword in its most basic definition is a weapon with a long blade and a hilt with a handguard, used for thrusting and or cutting. But how dangerous can a sword cut be for an unprotected body? And to what extent does strength fit into the equation? What does a sword cut do to the connective muscular nervous and epithelial human tissue? What happens at a molecular level? A cut is an opening made with a sharp implement. According to contact mechanics, the study of the deformation of solids that touch each other at one or more point, the easiest way to cut a soft solid with a knife is by a slicing action. Dragging the sharp blade over the soft surface, without pushing too strongly into it. If you push the edge of the knife too strongly into a soft solid, you will squash it. Translating this into sword play, although strength plays a part, technique, speed, blade geometry, edge alignment, experience, the modulus of elasticity of the metal, all of these factors have a pivotal role in how to properly and effectively operate a bladed weapon. Now, a sword is a very technical weapon in all of its forms. So the notion that a Japanese katana is a very technical weapon which required training, whereas, for example, a knightly sword is nothing but a barbaric implement which only included brute force and no technique, is nonsensical, ignorant and ludicrous. It is ignorant of the very way our species evolved and came to be through natural selection. All swords are technical weapons because of their very nature of cutting, thrusting and slicing armaments, which require training awareness, technique and only a certain amount of strength, enough to wield and accelerate the weapon up to a reasonable speed. In swordplay, muscles and mind are inseparably connected. Fighting ability is recognized as fundamental to intersexual competition in many non-human species, but fighting ability doesn't only include strength. Looking at the very roots of our species to assess the importance of physical strength and mental conditioning within an hypothetical altercation between members of the same species, juxtaposed also with the relevance of technical training, we learn that research on humans and non-human primates shows that males often try to attain dominance by aggressive behaviour with other males, and males with greater physical strength have a greater likelihood to overpower their opponent. All of this being linked to sexual dimorphism, possibly a result of intersexual selection, as competing with rivals for mates occurs and is partially evident on male physical characteristics, such as strength and size, which enable success in combat with other males. However, introducing sophisticated weapons into the equation is the natural result of the most evident characteristic of our species, our brains. In two recent studies, researchers from Duke University suggest the human brain boost may have been powered by a metabolic shift, which meant more fuel for brains, less fuel for muscle. While the brain makes up only 2% of our body mass, it consumes more than 20% of our oxygen supply and blood flow. Compare that to only 7-8% to in other primate species. The human brain uses more energy, pound for pound, than any other tissue in our body. Yet, if compared to other primates our size, our body burns the same number of calories. The primary source of energy for the brain is glucose. Glucose is pumped into cells where it's needed most with the help of proteins called glucose transporters, which are encoded by a family of about a dozen genes. The researchers have found two glucose transporter genes, one of which, called SLC2A1, is mostly turned on in brains, whereas the other one, called SLC2A4, is turned on mostly in muscles. The researchers compare the human version of the genes with the same genes in chimps and two more distantly related primates, orangutans and macaques. When they compare the DNA sequences of the genes from each species, they found a number of changes in the human version of each gene, but not the other three species. To find out if those changes may have helped to ferry more glucose to brains and less to muscles, they measured the amount of mRNA copies of each gene, a measure of how much protein the gene is likely to make in brain, muscle and liver samples from each species. Compared with chimps, humans make three times more of the glucose transport found in brains, but only 60% of that found in muscles. Mankind is a naturally optimized weapon designing race and the fusion of some physical strength and the engineering capability of the brain is the most effective way to master our chances of dominance.
Returning to further DNA proof, another set of genes that may have funneled more energy to brains and less to muscles is a metabolite called creatine. Now we said that glucose is the brain's primary fuel, but when glucose runs low, creatine provides a backup source of energy, which is quick. Considering two human males engaging in combat, having the first being significantly physically stronger than the second one, the mathematical odds change completely the moment a melee weapon is introduced into the equation. And for a bladed weapon, strength not being the driving factor, the weaker individual with a blade will increase dramatically his chances of domination against the physically stronger individual, demonstrating brute force and blades are not intertwined. Thus, completely debunking the Victorian idea, medieval knight with blade equals brute. So, is a more curved sword necessarily a better cutting sword than a straight sword? Well, let's ask one of my favourite content creators. Hey folks, Matt Easton here from Scholar Gladiatoria and I'm doing this for my friend Raffaello over at Metatron channel and he asked me to give my views fairly briefly on the difference in cutting between curved swords and straight swords. Now, this is a huge topic and it would be very easy for me to talk for the next half hour, which is not what I'm here to do this time. Uh, but quite, quite relatively briefly, there is a fundamental difference between straight swords and curved swords in that if I just grab a couple here, so I've got a couple of uh, 19th century sabers, this being later 19th century, this being earlier 19th century, and um, they meet the target at different angles. So if I just put the straight sword down for a second, quite Quite simply you can see that if you're swinging an object um, at something intending to hit, the curved blade will more often, not always, because it can meet the target perpendicular like that, but will very often meet the target at a slant. If you think about walking up a hill, for example, that means instead of walking straight up the hill, you're now walking diagonally up the hill, which means that the effective angle, the angle of the edge as it's meeting the target, is reduced to smaller angle. There is another factor as well which is very important to mention and that relates to swordsmanship. So often when people address um, this, this sort of idea of curved swords versus straight swords, they think about it purely in, in physics terms and they don't think about the realities of using a sword. Well, one of the realities is when you hit a person, you don't really want the object to stop on the target, okay? So what we tend to do is rather than, unless you're doing something like a Scheitelhauer or a specific type of blow where you're hitting perpendicular to the target, you generally speaking hit the target in such a way that it enters the target, cuts into it and then draws through and out so that your weapon is free to hit the target again or defend yourself or hit another target or do whatever. So having your weapon able to give a cut or slash we could say, pass through the target and out is actually quite advantageous and having a curved blade does facilitate that. For that reason, we often see curved blades associated with cavalry use because, of course, moving on a, on a horse, you're going to hit something and carry on moving past it. So it can facilitate that slashing, slicing uh, blow as you, as you pass through and beyond something. But that being said, don't think that curved swords necessarily always cut better than straight swords. That's not the case. Straight swords have some other advantages. Um, here is a sword which is straight, uh, but as you can see, it is very much geared towards cutting. This is a falchion of a 13th century design. Um, and very clearly it is a cutting centric sword. This is not a thrusting sword as I'm sure anybody watching this can see. Um, but the handle is in line with the blade. So this means that you hit quite similar to hitting something with a, with a mace or a stick. Um, and the, the object that's, uh, the part of the blade that's hitting is in line with the hand and the lever of motion. When we have a curved sword, despite the fact that curved swords do have some advantages, the curve can often be behind the line of leverage, okay? Which does mean, it does mean that you hit slightly after where your hand kind of expects, naturally expects to hit. In some other curved uh, weapons, for example, a coppice or falcata or a cookery, the blade can be curved, but actually in front of. And sometimes, some types of sabers have a canted grip. That is the tang and grip of the weapon is curved in such a way that although the weapon is curved, the curve is brought forward like that in front of the line of leverage. 
This has a uh, increased chopping potential, a bit like an axe, but it reduces that drawing through um, effect that I mentioned at the beginning of, um, of the video. So there we go. There, fundamentally, there are differences between cutting with straight and curved swords. You can't really say that one is better and one is worse. It depends on the context and it, it, it is linked to precisely how you intend to use that sword on horseback, on foot, um, and against what type of targets and in what type of conflict. Hope that's been interesting. Cheers, folks. Thank you very much, Matt Easton, for sharing your knowledge. In the case of a sharp weapon such as a sword and of a blunt weapon such as a mace, the result of an impact with the human body will have different ramifications. Blunt force trauma usually causes a contusion, a closed wound, while in pathology a wound specifically refers to a sharp injury which damages the dermis of the skin, the dermis being a layer of skin between the epidermis with which it makes up the cutis and subcutaneous tissues that primarily consist of dense irregular connective tissue that cushions the body from stress and strain. Clearly, the deeper the cut, the greater the area involved. Wounds caused by a clean, sharp-edged object such as a sword or a knife are called incisions, while wounds caused by an object such as a knife entering and coming out from the skin are called penetration wounds. When you strike and draw with a sword so that the blade slides across the target, you're making a cut. This is in comparison to the thrust, where you strike with the intention of driving the point into the target instead of drawing across it. But what generates friction? Well, the answer is movement. Specifically, moving two objects against each other in opposite directions. In a sword cut, it is therefore important to make sure that our strike creates the maximum amount of movement of the blade across the target. Form follows function, of course. The curve is a trade-off between cutting and thrusting. The human body consists of nanometer-sized units, namely protein, appetite, crystallite, collagen and myelin fibers. It consists of about 10 to the 27 molecules. This number is so massive that it is impossible to determine their location or even only to store this amount of data. The stress generated by a cutting implement is directly proportional to the force with which it is applied and inversely proportional to the area of contact. Hence, the smaller the area, the less force is needed to cut something. For organic matter such as bread and human skin, cutting is a straightforward process because cells, tissues, proteins, etc. can be broken apart with relatively little energy. This is because organic matter is much more flexible and the molecules bind through weak intermolecular interaction, such as hydrogen bonding and the van der Waals forces. In the case of inorganic matter, it being much more of a complicated process, I will refer to a different video in the future. When applying too much strength during the cut, purely normal deformation leads to global deformation of the soft solid, so that the blade has to penetrate deeply into the sample, well beyond the lineal regime, to reach the relatively large critical strength to nucleate fracture. In contrast, a slicing motion leads to fracture nucleation, with minimal deformation of the bulk, and thus a much lower barrier. This transition between global and local deformations in soft solids as a function of the angle of shear explains the mechanics and the design of guillotine blades. When discussing biological cells, what's impressive is that even the number of cells within the human body is beyond our imagination. The number of stars in the Milky Way, for instance, is thousands times smaller than this number. If you manage to imagine everything in scale, then your average knife is a giant metal monster compared to a molecule. Your average sharp knife is a few micrometers thick and its sharpest points, and blunt knives are about a hundred times thicker than that. Again, putting everything into perspective, this is hundreds to millions of times bigger than even a large molecule diameter. Muscle tissue is mostly made from myofibers, muscle cells. The fibers aren't closely bonded to each other because they're swimming in water, lipids and other proteins. When you cut it, you are basically prying apart the myofibers which are only barely bonded. The mechanics of the cut function the following way. When you cut, you use a sharp tip to translate a small force into a gigantic pressure, which we will call enormous shear stress. This pressure is very local, but very, very big, and when it gets into contact with skin, the skin ruptures under the critical pressure. Alright number ones, I hope that you enjoyed this video, if you did please remember thumbs up and subscribe to my channel for more content from the Metatron. If you like this uh, series, well consider that this is the first episode of the new series Combat Science. So if you liked it, share it with your friends and remember, the Metatron has spread his wings. Goodbye. Is that an enemy aircraft? Get down! Yes, that doesn't look like an enemy. Oh.